So every time our heart beats, it sends a signal to your brain. And this is what I think is so amazing about the complexity of our brain, that it's responding to the outside world. It's also responding to your hidden thoughts. And then simultaneously, it also has represented in its activity the moment-to-moment -moment fluctuations and signals that are coming from your internal visceral organs. So as you sit here listening, your brain is activating with each heartbeat. And it's not just your heart. You have represented in the neural activity of your brain signals from the other organs as well. So you also have, for example, the slow wave of the stomach also being represented in your brains right now. Thus, our minds and our bodies are intrinsically and dynamically coupled. Our thoughts, feelings and behaviours are shaped by, in part, the internal signals that arise from our body. And this is important because the signals from our body are informative. Our hearts do not just beat regularly. And in fact, our hearts have these beautiful patterns of activation and um, flutters and um, uh, uh, like curves of increasing and decreasing activity. And these different signatures are associated with different states. For example, if you're sitting here waiting in anticipation, then your heart does this classic slowing down. And this will happen when you're waiting at the traffic lights and other day-to-day -day activities. And you also have these patterns of acceleration and deacceleration curves that occur with different emotional states. And if you model these cardiac changes in brain and see which areas are co-activated, you have areas involved in emotion that co-activate with changes in the heart. And this helps subserves this idea that our feelings derive from this dynamic relationship between brain and body. And our senses thus fall into different categories. You have extraception, which is sensing the outside world. And this occurs through traditional senses, such as sight and also touch. These can be contrasted from, um, to proprioception, which is sensing the position of your body in space. And this, too, then can be contrasted um, to interoception, which is sensing the inside world, such as your internal visceral organs, such as your heartbeats. And if you were to come to my lab, then I would sit you down and I would test how accurately you can detect when your heart is beating. And we can do this with different tests. Um, for example, I would attach a pulse oximeter to your finger, and I might simply get you to count the number of heartbeats while you're at rest and see how accurate you are. Or I might play you tones in sync and out of sync with your heart and see how well you can make these synchronicity judgments. And these are classic heartbeat detection tests, but my work shows um, that people don't necessarily have insight into how good or poor they are. So you might think you're guessing on every trial, but actually you might be performing perfectly at these tasks. And thus, we can characterize individual differences in interoceptive accuracy and interoceptive awareness, and then see how these individual differences then map on to the way in which you experience emotion. And the role of the body in emotion has long been known. William James, in 1884, theorized that it's the sensing of internal bodily sensations that gives rise to your emotional experience that you're not afraid because you, you run, or you're afraid it's the act of running which gives rise to the sense of fear, because it's the feeling of the pounding of your heart which gives rise to this feeling of fear. And we were able to look at this in the lab, doing experiments to test the way in which the detection of body sensations might increase your emotion. So those individuals who are more interoceptively accurate will feel emotions with a greater intensity. And as modern day neuroscientists, we're also able to look at the neurocircuitry in the brain that underlie this. So if I put you in a scanner um, and get you to focus on your heart, then you'll see activated this area called the anterior insula. And the degree to which this is activated predicts how good you are at detecting your heart. So the more interceptively accurate you are, the more activity you have in this particular region. 
And if I also get you to be emotional in a scanner and see which areas are underlying emotion processing in general, you also have this area activated. And a conjunction analysis of both emotion processing and cardiac monitoring particularly shows up this area, giving rise to the idea that this area is integrating bodily signals to give rise to the experience of emotion. Thus, our hearts are able to guide our emotional experiences. Detecting these signals can influence the intensity with which we experience emotions. But what I really want to speak to you about today is the fact that our hearts tell us not just about how we're feeling, but our hearts can also be informative about how other people around us are also feeling. So, for example, in this particular experiment by Convalinka et al., they monitored the hearts of people who were undergoing particular rituals, in this case, a firewalking ritual, where people need to walk over burning embers and coals. And they monitored the heart of the person undergoing this. And then they also monitored the heart simultaneously to a relative or a spouse or an unrelated observer. And what they were able to see, that for the related person or the person married to the individual in question undergoing this, you have these beautiful trackings of heart rate that happen between the individual and the related observer. Thus, the cardiac changes that were occurring in the person going over the burning embers and coals were also expressed in the observer. And it's not just our hearts that can represent the state of other. It can also happen in other physiological signatures, such as the eyes. And one of my favorite experiments by Neil Harrison and Hugo Critchley was they monitored the eyes of people, um, and they also got people to look at faces. And these faces depicted all different emotions, happy and sad. And then they manipulated the pupil size of the faces. And they found that small pupil size was particularly associated with sad faces. And if a sad face had a smaller pupil size, then people judged those faces as sadder. But then what I think is so beautiful is that when they were monitoring the pupil size of the observer, their own pupil size got smaller as well. And this happened specifically with sad faces. Thus, this physiological signature of sadness, which is a smaller pupil size, then happens in the observer, such that they're not just saying or feeling sad for the person, they're actually trying to embody and feel that feeling themselves. Their body is adopting the physiological signature of sadness such that they experience it too. And in our search to understand these mechanisms that underlie emotion, we can see how maybe populations and individuals who process emotion slightly differently may have different channels of information. And a lot of my work at present is working with people with autistic spectrum conditions. And people with autism um, can have trouble sometimes understanding their own emotion and the emotions of others. And my work with these individuals show that they're also impaired in their capacity to accurately detect internal bodily signals such as their heartbeats. But focusing on this gives you part of the story, which is potentially this is a mechanism through which emotion processing is potentially impaired in these individuals. But it's only part of the story. And actually, if you monitor their body, and monitor their body while other people are experiencing emotions or pain, then people with autism have a body response which shares the emotions with others. So for example, Guetel did an experiment where people um, had pain stimuli applied to them and people watched this occur. And people with autism had an embodied skin conductance response that, that represented pain of the other person in themselves. So thus, they were having an embodied empathetic response. But not being able to detect these signals accurately also comes with a cost. So some of our work is also looking at anxiety and showing that errors in interceptive processing predict higher anxiety symptomatology. But we're working now to create software platforms to 
make people more interceptively accurate, such as heart rate and heart rate clinical. And we're giving people tools to be more precise in detecting their internal bodily signals and showing that this can increase their accuracy and also potentially decrease their anxiety. So, your heart is a wonderful thing. If you per perceive it accurately, it can help you have lower anxiety levels, providing you just notice it's your heart. And this precision of detecting internal bodily signals can also help you experience motions more intensely. But the thing that I really want to stress today is that your heart can inform you not only about your own emotions, but also about the emotions of those people around you. That our hearts and our bodies can represent other people's joy, sadness, and fear within ourselves. So in this search for utopia, and in trying to understand how we build communities, I believe that we build communities by building bonds between people. And one of the ways this can happen is through our physiological signals representing the emotions of others. So pay attention to your heart. It will help tell you how you're feeling, but it will help you experience other people as well. Thank you.